I'm gonna stop while I'm ahead. Hello, welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather and milk on the counter means that we have another dairy processing day. So the last time I had a dairy processing day with you guys, I made things like butter and buttermilk and some cheeses. I'm making cheese again today, but it's a different type of cheese. This is a farmer's cheese and it's really versatile and super easy. And also because we're headed up on Christmas time and I haven't found any eggnog in my local store, we're going to do some goat milk eggnog today too. It's important to remember that when you are heating up milk at all, you want to use a heavy bottomed pot. Doing so will just really help the milk not scald. And because we're making cheese, we want to use a pot that is non-reactive, which means a pot that isn't going to be affected by acid. Because in order to curdle our our milk to make curds and whey, we are going to be using some apple cider vinegar. And if I was using like an aluminum pot, that vinegar would etch away at the aluminum and put it into my cheese, which is something that I don't want. So you want to be able to use something like this, like enameled cast iron or stainless steel to make your cheeses. Usually when I have any kind of dairy processing day, it's because I have about an extra two and a half gallons of milk. My pot here only fits around two gallons, so I think that is as much milk as I'm going to use today. And if you've been in the kitchen with me in the past, you know that I make messes. It's just, it's part of the deal. Goodness, I got it all over here. So either I was wrong about the size of my pot or my gallon size jug is a little bit bigger than I thought because I can only fit about a gallon and a half in here. So that's what I'm going to be working with today. See all the lovely cream and fat sticking to this jar? Remember that because we're going to be talking about that later. So the last cheeses that I made on camera with you guys were raw milk cheeses. This milk is going to be heated up to 185 degrees, which is going to pasteurize the milk. I have made farmer's cheese doing a low temp pasteurization. I think I heated up the milk to 165 degrees at that time, but I find that if I don't heat the milk up enough, I don't get as much cheese out of it. There's something about heating the milk up, not to boiling, but to about 185, 190 degrees that really gets the most out of the milk. So I have the burner on medium high and as it heats up, every once in a while I'm gonna come by and just give the milk a gentle stir just to make sure things are heating up evenly. So while the milk is heating up for our cheese, we are gonna get started on the eggnog because the milk also has to get to a bare simmer, as they call it, for the eggnog as well. I'm assuming a bare simmer is around 165 to 185 degrees, a lot like our cheese recipe. I am going to double the recipe for the eggnog and I am gonna change a couple things just because our circumstances are a little bit different compared to someone who has to buy a lot of their ingredients at the grocery store. So because I'm doubling it, I am going to put in 12 eggs. I added a couple more eggs here, so there are 14. I added a couple more eggs because I am going to be adding a couple more cups of milk because in total we will be needing six cups of liquid and well a half gallon is what I really want to work with today. I'm trying to clear the milk out of my refrigerator. That's the whole point of dairy processing day and I'm going to be using the full half gallon here. So, so I have 14 egg yolks. Yolks only. If I didn't specify that before, I totally meant to. I have egg yolks only in the bowl and we're going to be creaming together with sugar. So I've got one cup of sugar here. Just whisk this together. This looks nice and smooth to me, so I'm going to set this aside. Make sure you spill some or it doesn't count, okay? If you have your own dairy animals, this specific recipe calls for putting together milk and cream. Um, it calls for two cups of milk, one cup of cream for the single recipe. And a lot of milk that you can buy at the store, I think even whole milk has been skimmed a little bit because you won't often find the milk from the store sticking to glass like this. And this is what I wanted to double back and talk about. I don't think that anybody who raises dairy goats or dairy cows 
at home really needs to worry about adding in cream. What you have at your farm is likely more than enough because I think that there's a lot more fat and quality in the home raised milk. So I am not going to be using milk and cream because I think it's a little bit redundant for the ingredients that we have here. So to the milk that is heating up on the stove, I'm just gonna put what they say is a pinch of salt. And because I'm doubling the recipe, I'm going to put in a full teaspoon of nutmeg. Our cheese milk is steaming a little bit, so I've gotta check the temp on this. We're close, we're not quite there. And you may have noticed that I did crank the heat up to high. I'm not known for my patience, so if you do happen to break some rules like me and turn your burner up to high, make sure that you watch it because it is gonna heat up much faster and it does have more of a chance of sticking to the bottom and scalding. And if it does happen to boil and you have very little space at the top of your pot like me, it is going to be the worst mess of your life. Ask me how I know. So don't let it boil. Okay, so we're getting real close to our target temp. I'm gonna bring you a little bit closer so you can see what happens when we add the vinegar. So for the amount of milk that I have in my pot here, I'm gonna use just less than two cups of 5% acidity apple cider vinegar. You can use regular vinegar. Um, I just happen to use apple cider vinegar because we have people in our family that are allergic to corn and believe it or not, vinegar is made from corn. I'm gonna gently pour the vinegar over my spoon just to help me distribute the vinegar throughout the milk a little bit more efficiently. It's a good thing I left myself a little bit of space in this pot, guys. Now I do want to distribute the vinegar throughout the milk evenly, but I don't exactly want to be breaking up the lovely curds that are being created. So I'm going to be very gentle and do as minimal amount of stirring as I need to in order to distribute the vinegar. See what's happening here? I'm gonna stop while I'm ahead. So what I'm gonna do at this point is take this off of the burner. I'm actually just gonna move it back a little bit just to get it off of the heat. And then I'm gonna let this sit here for 20 minutes. And while this is sitting and doing its thing, the curds and whey are separating, we can focus on our eggnog. Okay, so after looking at the recipe a little bit closer, I'm seeing that my target temp for the milk is 160 degrees. We are there, so now it's time for the tricky part. I have done this once before, but it's been a while, and I have done this method before while making homemade puddings. This is how you thicken a lot of homemade puddings. But what we wanna do is temper the eggs. So we need to add this hot milk to the eggs slowly, slowly, so that we don't wind up scrambling the eggs and just getting a concoction of hot milk and scrambled eggs. That does not sound as appetizing as what we're going for, some eggnog, so we've got to do things nice and slow. The recipe says to take a big scoop of milk and add it slowly to our eggs while whisking vigorously. So here we go. So far, no scrambling, so we're doing well. So now it's safe to put the whole egg mixture back on the burner, turn it on medium and heat it back up to around 160. Let it thicken up just slightly and then we're going to remove it from the burner. I'm gonna put it in a different vessel and then we're gonna refrigerate it and let it thicken up. I almost forgot one of the important parts and it's probably never too late to add the vanilla that the recipe calls for. I have this really cool vanilla bean paste. I'm gonna put a good dab in our eggnog here and whisk it in and then chill it. Isn't that cool? It's not gonna come up on camera, but you can see little vanilla bean seeds inside this paste. It's really cool. You can see our eggnog is already thickening up well. It's coating my whisk really nicely. 
but it needs to chill in order to achieve perfection. So this bowl is really hot. I don't think it would be friendly to my refrigerator to put it straight in the fridge. So I am gonna let this sit on the counter for a little while and cool down before I ask it to cool down further in the refrigerator. It's just gonna be a lot of work for my fridge. So it has been far longer than 20 minutes, but that is a-okay. The job has been well done. You can see our curds and whey have separated. So that nice yellow liquid, that's our whey. And what's left are the lovely cheese curds. And we're going to strain those right over here. So it's actually a relatively frequent occurrence where I will leave this sitting for longer than 20 minutes. So feel free to do so should you need to. I don't think it really hurts it any to have it sit a little bit longer. I have this really nice cheese ladle here, but any slotted spoon would work just fine in order to transfer the curds and the whey over. And once most of them are moved over, I am ultimately just going to be pouring the whole thing over and through this muslin here. I don't like using cheesecloth very much at all because I find that for at least the cheeses that I make, the soft cheeses, that too much curd gets lost through the cheesecloth and I don't like that. I wanna keep as much cheese as possible, which look, we're getting a lot. I can tell right now that I am milking my Nigerians. So if you really want lots of cheese and lots of butter and lots of things out of your milk, Nigerian dwarf goat is the way to go if you're thinking about getting dairy goats because they, they perform very well in the milk department. Even if they don't give you quantity, they can give a whole bunch of quality, that's for sure. So now that we have most of the whey drained out, I want to hang this muslin bag from my cabinet just to allow it to drain a little bit more. Now, this is a cheese that I don't wanna leave hanging for a real long time because if I have too much of the whey um, out of the cheese, it doesn't stick together as well. And I do want a formed cheese. So I'll show you how I tie things up. Opposing corners first. And then I'm going to bring this corner and slide it through and under the knot so that the knot winds up on the outside of the bag here. And then I can hang it up like this. Otherwise, I find that the knot ends up sitting down into the cheese and then you lose bits of cheese into the fabric. And you know, like I said before, I want as much cheese as possible in my belly, not stuck in the fabric. There are a few little open spots here at the top of the bag, and I'm just gonna close those up with a clothespin. I don't want any flies or like dust particles, hairs, anything like that flying into the cheese. So at this point, we have a lot of whey. There's well over a gallon's worth of whey, and the rest of it is, is the cheese. And I can squeeze slightly on the bag here to get some of the whey out. I don't want my cheese to be sopping wet. There's kind of a a delicate balance of too wet and too dry. However, if you do find that you leave the cheese hanging for too long or you squeeze too much out, it's kind of falling apart and not forming well, you can stir some whey back into the cheese. So don't get rid of this quite yet. And really, you don't wanna get rid of it, like throw it away or put it down the drain at all, because in the very least, it's an excellent animal feed additive. So there's several things that you can do with whey. This is technically a vinegar whey. And so there's not as many uses for this as there would be from whey that came off of like yogurt or something like that, um, sweet whey's. This is not a sweet whey, so you couldn't use it to like start a fermentation project or something because it's not gonna it's not gonna work with all that vinegar in it and that's a good thing to talk about that vinegar that we put in to create the curds and whey that comes out in the whey and none of that flavor ends up in the cheese something i've seen people do instead of hanging and squeeze is to lay out a towel on the counter and wrap this muslin satchel in the towel and kind of lean on it and squeeze the whey out that way I just don't have any clean towels, so that's not where we're at today. Plus, this is what I normally do anyway. It works well. Mm -hmm. 
So this is the part of the cheese making process where we get to add our flavorings. You can add pretty much whatever you want here, but don't skimp out on the salt if it's not something that you have to be restricted on anyways because of your diet. This is relatively tasteless without salt, so you really need that to bring out the flavor. So don't be shy, however. Go slow at first and taste it as you go until you kind of learn what works. What I'm gonna be using to season my cheese today is an umami mushroom seasoning. I love this. We buy this at the Asian market and it already has salt in it. So I'm gonna start out with probably a tablespoon and a half, given how much cheese I see down here, and then I am going to taste it. Again, this isn't straight salt. There's salt in this, but it's not the only component. So don't just be putting a whole tablespoon and a half of, uh, of salt. One of my favorite herbs to add to this cheese when I do an herbed cheese is fresh dill. Fresh dill just, it's lovely in this application, but I'm a little bit partial because I love fresh dill in everything. But we've made it with differing spices where like, let's say you wanna add rosemary, oregano, and basil. We've done similar things before and we've called it pizza cheese. <laughs> this kind of cheese though, it's not one that's gonna melt. So it's not something that you could use on pizza, but it's really great just as a snacking cheese and you can crumble it up or leave it crumbled like this and use it like a salad topping. It's almost perfect. It needs a little bit more seasoning, believe it or not. I think I'm gonna add some garlic powder. Garlic powder, a little more. And then we'll add some parsley for color. Okay, now it's time for molding. So you can really use any kind of dish or mold that you want. I have used muffin tins in the past. Silicone ones work really well to be able to pop out the little individual cheesecakes, if you will. I like to use these little bowls that I have. I've got a few different sizes, and I find that if I run a knife along the outside edge and kind of press gently, that the cheese does pop out really well. So I like to use these for molding cheese. So once you have a good amount of cheese scooped up into your mold, you want to press it down with your utensil to kind of force those curds to stick together. So if you are getting quite a lot of whey kind of bubbling up as you're squeezing, your cheese might be a little bit too wet. And if you're finding that your curds maybe aren't sticking together as well as you'd like, like this is, this is good, this is what you're looking for, and maybe you need to add a little bit more whey to your bowl and stir it in. But this, this is what we're looking for. So just like the eggnog, it is time for the cheese to chill as well. So we're gonna come back to both in the morning and see how they turned out. Alrighty, here we are. It's the next day and I've got hay in my hair because I just finished chores, but that doesn't make this eggnog any less delicious. Look how yellow it is. This is what happens when you make eggnog with farm fresh eggs because those yolks are so orange. You get quite the yellow eggnog out of it, but it's good and thick. You can see it sticking to the bottle and now it's time to give it our second taste test because you can probably tell I have much less eggnog than the milk that I started out with yesterday. That's because we had some with dessert for dinner. So it was great. It is great, but I'd like to show it to you. Isn't that awesome? A little dash of cinnamon. Cheers. It's so much better even the next day because I feel like the flavors of the nutmeg and things really get to soak in to the lovely, lovely eggnog. So while I bottled it or before I bottled it, I did strain it through a mesh strainer because there are some little gritty bits, probably some of the spices or a little bit of scrambled egg that happens that does kind of ruin the texture of the eggnog. So make sure you do that. 
really thick, really delicious. And with our farm fresh milk, there was absolutely no need to add in any extra cream. Now we're gonna unmold this cheese because I need to cut some up and get it ready for lunchtime. But there's a little bit of condensation on the inside, nothing wrong with that. Everything smells really awesome. Just need to pop it out onto a cutting board. So I know earlier I mentioned running a knife along the inside edge of the bowl. That you can do, but you can also take the tines of a fork, kind of just loosen up the edge of the cheese in the mold and you can see it start moving, probably not necessarily on camera, maybe you can, but once you get it good and loosened, it should pop right out. Just like that. See how nicely it holds together? This is a really awesome snacking cheese. It's an excellent flavor, really amazing creamy texture. And it's funny, if you've got goats, you understand, you can tell when you have milk from your differing breeds. We keep La Mancha's Nigerian Dwarf and a couple mixed breed goats. And I can always tell when I stop milking certain goats and then when I start milking other goats because the difference in the milk and then you know in the products that you make from the milk is really marked some goats even though they're like let's, let's say i'm milking all nigerians right now individual goats milk will taste different depending on what their preferences are while they're eating and probably somewhat in their genetics and how much butter fat and stuff that they can produce so it's really cool to be able to taste the difference in the seasons with this cheese so remember I made two wheels of cheese? That other wheel I'm gonna vacuum seal and put in the freezer. This cheese freezes very, very well. I just thawed out in the refrigerator a day or so before I want it, and it tastes exactly like the day that I made it. So very great option to be able to freeze and have again later when maybe I don't have a lot of surplus milk and I don't have enough milk to make cheese. So there's lots that can be made out of goat milk. I think goats sometimes get a bad rap, like they're not just as good as cows. They definitely are, especially if you have a cream separator. So if you missed the video where I did my cream separating day and I made more things out of goat milk, I'm gonna link that video up here. And pretty soon I'm gonna show you how to make caramel out of goat's milk. So make sure you subscribe and stick around.